Wish you were one of those influencers with raving fans who binge on your every word, consume all your content, buy everything you have to sell and demand even more? Then stay tuned while Authority Magazine columnist and BuzzFeed contributor Tracy Hazard shares strategies, tips, and tactics from top videocasters, podcasters, authors, and social influencers on creating that bingeable factor. Now, let's join Tracy as she explores how to rise above all the digital noise with The Binge Factor. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Binge Factor. I'm Tracy Hazard. And today I have a client who has come on board to do a Binge Factor hot seat. And she's going to do a combo. We're going to do a hybrid today. We're going to do both a little bit of on-air coaching and tip giving um, from my end to her, as well as, of course, get her binge factor and get her tips for you. She is the experimental leader. That is her show name and it is her book. And I have Melanie Parrish for you today. She's an author, a public speaker, a founder of the Experimental Leader Academy and master certified coach. She's an expert in problem solving, constraints management, operations, strategic hiring, and brand development. Melanie has consulted and coached organizations ranging from Fortune 50 company to IT startups. Her individual clients include those in FANG, F-A-A-N-G, and other top global IT companies. As an author, educator, and creator of the Experimental Leader book, Melanie shows people new ways of thinking about their leadership, informed by her understanding of the fast-paced ride of technology innovation. She's based in Ontario and in New Mexico. So I am excited about talking Experimental Leader because I love to think about podcasting as an experiment as something that is a work in progress. Um, I I like to call things a design of experiment. That's a a term that I learned in product development. And when Tom and I were always working in that, where we learned that when you create something, create a product, in this case, you create a podcast, that you can't leave it as its own entity without making improvements over time. Because no matter how hard you work at designing it perfectly, and really making sure that everything's right. By the time you come to market, things shift. By the time uh, you get feedback from consumers or from listeners in this particular case, things shift in your thinking. So you have to think of it as always a work in progress. But I'm a big fan of the design of experiment model, right? So the DOE DOE model is that you would change one thing at a time. Because if you change everything, if you flip it all at once, uh, then what happens is, is you don't know what worked and what didn't. So we, I, I'm a fan of looking at your show as an experiment all along the way and making a tweak, making a shift, making a pivot, like keep moving it on the path to creating those things. And of course, testing things, experimenting with them along the way. So we did our on-air coaching testing. I did six episodes earlier in the year, got a lot of great feedback from them, but my, my feedback from my team and from everything that we were doing internally was that there is a better opportunity for us to do more of these hybrid interviews where we're going to do some coaching and we're going to do success tips as well. So we're doing that today with Melanie Parrish. So I'm so excited that the experimental leader, the queen of experimentation is right here to do this first hybrid test with us. So let's welcome Melanie Parrish of the experimental leader podcast. Melanie, thanks so much for joining me. I'm excited to talk experimentation in our podcasting today because you are the experimental leader. What made you start a podcast though? What made you take on this experiment? Yeah, well, I'm so excited to be here with you, Tracy. And um, well, I, like most experimenters, had a problem and I had to solve that problem. So I had a book, my book, The Experimental Leader, Um, came out April 7th. And my big marketing strategy was I was approved to be in Hudson News and airports. And it was the middle, you know, it was a month. The start of the pandemic. Yeah. (laughs) Part of the pandemic. And my strategy went out the window. And, um, and so one of my long-term goals was to sort of um, elevate myself as a speaker um, also sort of out in the pandemic. And then like my really long-term goal was to 
launch courses and start to do some really cool online content. And I realized that kind of all the, all roads lead to Rome. And uh, I thought a podcast was a really great way to uh, start to, you know, just share thoughts and talk about things in a more deep way and not a marketing way. I, I really, I I'm kind of shy. Um, I have to, you know, get people to help me with my social because I, um, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't put things out every day. I would be horrified if I had to do it myself. So, um, I, I thought a podcast was a really good way to have deep conversations. And I think I always like, because, um, questions are the heart of coaching. I always thought I might have really good questions. And so (laughs) you do, um, by the way, you do have (laughs) really good questions. So, yeah. So, you know, that that's, that's, I think a really great approach. And I, I hear this from a lot of authors who are struggling. They didn't really have the platform they thought they had. So you may have found it, you needed it anyway, whether there was a pandemic or not. So right. it probably worked yeah. out perfect for you either way, <laughs> being forced to do it. So your audience is, is all those people leading teams with a a kind of tech edge to it, which I really love because you, you yeah. work with a lot of um, developers, software companies, you know, tech edge type companies. I think that's really, really fun. And the experiment message, I think really, really lends itself to, to that. Did you really agonize over the, over coming up with the title, uh, the name for your show? No, it was like, you know, you know, when people like talk about the call to ministry or something, the title, um, well, because like it's the also the title the, of your book, it's right? It's the title of the book. And and so I knew the entire time I was writing the book that I was writing the book, The Experimental Leader. Like that was the book I was writing from the beginning. And, you know, at some point in the publishing, they were like, well, we have to talk about title. And I was like, well, I don't know what else you would call this book. I know exactly what this, <laughs> this fits book it. is uh, <laughs> But it yeah. is it is so interesting. Um, it was act- it's actually inter- the the title of the podcast. You know, I had a friend who was like, "Well, you don't want everything to be under the same brand," and which is true. That. But in this case, you know, there's so many podcasts that are targeted to leaders, right? So coaching for leaders, executive information for leaders, tapping into the success factors of leaders, right? There's so many podcasts around that, but that experimental portion of it just adds an edge. And that has really Mm -hmm. put you in a, in a separate place. And I think that that's really good that you kept it. I, I think so too. And now I can't even imagine having named it something else. And, and it, it is really interesting to just sort of look at the world through that lens. And um, I also had this big realization recently that um, that I wrote the book for pretty experienced leaders and that um, often people sort of enter my business as less experienced leaders, like sort of they're in the most pain, like zero to three years into their leadership. And so I've actually started to figure out products that fill that gap. And that's been interesting too, to sort of realize that, you know, that, that book that I wrote, the podcast, all of that is targeted toward, um, I wanted smart people who are good leaders to read it and get something, but but I've realized there's this uh, earlier gap. So I'm there's this earlier gap. Well, too. you know what? That's so true. That's a lot of times we put something out there like a book or a podcast and we intend to have a certain audience and it comes out and turns out we just don't, you know, when Tom and mm-hmm. I started our 3d print podcast and I tell this story a lot, we WTFFF was geared towards someone who already was in the know hat. I mean, you wouldn't know that FFF stands for fused filament fabrication. It, you know, <laughs> it, it, you wouldn't choose our show if you didn't already know that. But what we found was there was so many people like just thinking, I'd like to try this 3D printing thing, picking up our show. We ended up with this really early on audience and they ended up age demographic all over the place, which we didn't expect either. We thought they'd be, you know, young kids, Mm -hmm. you know, starting college, that kind of thing or in the garage at 14. But it wasn't. They were like retirees. So, you know, same thing is like we sometimes find out really surprising ways what our audience is. So how Mm -hmm. did you realize? that that was your audience? Well, I think, I think it, um, well, I think the leaders in tech, like there's a little bit of chicken and egg. Um, so it's, it's both the clients I already serve, but it's also the clients I'd love to serve. Mm. I 
also think that they have, um, I just keep having these sort of interesting sort of ahas or realizations around that client. You know, I, I had this realization recently. I have a client who's in accounting, who runs accounting in a global organization. And, um, and this client got an MBA in accounting um, or finance or something. And then did that job for a couple of years and then got promoted to leadership, but never did a leadership degree. And so there's, it's- So they're thrown into it, which is why they're, they're searching for something. Yeah. And your show, your show, your book, those are good matches because you're setting out there a, uh, this is what, when, when we're titling a show, I like it to be an embodiment of what the audience is aspiring to. So, yeah, I want to be a good leader. Everybody wants to be a successful leader, but an experimental leader might fit my personality just right, especially if I'm a creative or especially if I have that sort of developmental edge to what I do. Surprisingly, an accountant would choose that. But, you know, <laughs> I can't think of experimental accounting being like the ideal thing, but you never know. <laughs> well, and um, everyone's an ex a, an experimenter when it's not going right. We have to try right. new things to try to get a different outcome. This year has been like the Olympics for global experimental leader, you know, implementation. Well, there's in one of the episodes that I was listening to, as I was listening through your show that I, I, I got, you said someone asked you in like April. So, you know, a month after the pandemic started, asked you, um, to give them best practices on, on, on being yeah. a leader in the pandemic. And you were like, um, that seems like not possible. Um, would you like yeah. to, what we're experimenting with now? Like, and that made more sense to me. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. We don't have, and there's so many places we don't have best practices. I'm, I'm, I'm in Canada, but I'm watching because I'm a dual citizen. I'm watching like how the U S is opening up, how Canada is opening up right now. And nobody knows what to do. And, and, um, and so every, you know, people are trying things and, and then people are doing all their bad behaviors, their reactive behaviors, like blaming and you know, <laughs> that guy's doing it wrong and judging and, and uh, hindsight's 2020. They shouldn't have done you're, that. Yeah. You're watching like this global <laughs> scale of what it's like to be a part of an organization. Cause we are a world organization we, right now. And we're all a system right now. It's yeah. never been clearer how interrelated we all and are. And someone's and experiment might be infe infecting us literally. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. That's so, right. you know, I think of a podcast as an experiment because it doesn't always, it, there's, there's, so many variables along the way that we need to tweak, adjust. And if we don't look at it as a design of experiment, which is how I pretty much look at everything in the world anyway, um, because I'm a designer first and foremost, but if we don't look at it like that, then we aren't making continual improvements in our show. We just, we go out there, we set it out. We got to mm -hmm. give it enough time, right? Before we start making tweaks to it. Yeah. But if we look at it as a fluid thing, as an experiment, then I think we're going to be more successful. Have you mm -hmm. been, it seems that you have from listening to the show that you've made tweaks and experiments over the 40 episodes that you have so far. I have. What, what purposeful changes have you made? Well, some of them are just like those dumb, annoying things that you say. Like I realized I said, interesting a lot. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I did I awesome a lot in the beginning. So yeah. <laughs> Interesting is actually better than that. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, you're just kind of deer in the headlights, you know, you need to respond, but you're actually trying to think of the next question. And as you're just kind of getting your feet, you know, just these words come out of your mouth. So just experimenting with, and I still think of this in my head, I was thinking about it this morning, like, oh, what are synonyms for interesting? I should stick those on a sticky on my computer. Um, so there was that. And then um, an early piece of feedback that I got, and I love feedback, um, was that I should talk more. And, uh -huh. and okay. So I'm so glad you said that right now, because that's the first thing I thought when I started listening. Cause I, when I cut, when I check out a show, my process is to go to your first episode, listen to one in the first 10 
and then come to your more recent. And I will scan through it and see if, let's say, all your shows were interviews, which they were, except you had one standout that wasn't. So I also picked that one to listen to. Mm. And so that was the first thing, like I made a note on my pad. Ooh, I wish she had more of her in this. That first episode is missing that, right? There's, yeah, just jump right in. We don't know anything about Melanie Parrish. So, yeah. you know, and that, and that's a miss, but we do get it later. And so you really, I saw that improvement over the time in your oh, most recent thank you. I feel like it. my heart's like pounding. I'm so happy. Yeah. yeah I re- And I realized um, kind of in December, one of the things, so two more things that I've big experiments um, or changes. One was I realized I'm a leader and when I just interview people and I really love the inter- interview format, but I realized I need a voice. I need my leader voice. And so I added a little blurb just at the beginning um, where I started, I've started talking. I don't know how many of those episodes have aired. So it would have been in one of the latest it, ones only. I did hear that. So you're talking about, so you, and this is one of the wonderful things. So listeners out there, you're going to want to check out the experimental leader podcast and really listen to a couple of things that Melanie does both in her, in her open and her close. So in your setup, and that's what you're talking about, this sort of opening that you do past the music, past the you know formal opening, but you start to set up the guests that you're having. And that's you. It's about your thoughts, about your, your, Mm -hmm. your setting up that conversation that you're having. Are you recording that after? Yes. And it's obvious because there's an energy of what was talked about and a knowledge of it Mm -hmm. that's coming through there, which helps us as listeners feel that, that we must listen. We, that's the message that we get when it's done, when it's done before, and you don't know what's going to be said, you actually have a hesitancy in your voice. Like this is just natural for most people. You'll have a hesitancy in your voice that is like, I hope it's going to be good. <laughs> like, and you don't know, but after you've done it, you know, it was good. So you have the, a different energy about it. So that's why I love that you record that after. And you know, that makes a lot of sense for you. Now you're closed. You have a really strong close. Um, and I love that you have a, an ending phrase that is activating. So you tell everybody to go experiment. That's your ending. I do. And I love that. And so you, that strong close is so important. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I, I like that. Also, I always find, you know, like, because I'm a little shy, I notice even when I'm like recording course videos and things like that, I have to tell the person that does my video editing to just like, let me say goodbye one time, but don't say three. So the go experiment <laughs> gives me a way to finish. Because sometimes really the speaker helps. messes you up because you go back and forth and it's just odd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I it's just like, I don't know. And then the other thing that we started experimenting with or playing with is we take um, either the thing at the beginning or the thing at the end, and we use that as our intro on social. And then we don't, I don't yes. have to pay anybody to create that content. And I don't have to have a hired writer to do that because it's already transcribed and it's already there. So that's been a really good uh, thing that we did as we've gone. And I think they're pretty engaging um, because it's fresh content. It is. It is. That's that's wonderful that you're finding a reuse for all of those things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that I think your experimentation is great. So what's next? What are you going to try next? Oh, wait, I have to try. I have to tell you the last one. Oh, yeah. There was one more. One more. Yes, I have one more. So I decided um, that I don't um, because I'm talking about leadership. There's a lot of old white men who want to talk about leadership. And I get pitched all the time and I've decided I I don't have a hard rule against talking to old white men about leadership, but I've decided that if they're going to be on my podcast cast, then they're going to have to talk about women in leadership and they're going to have to talk about um, race and leadership. So they have to, they have to have a diversity conversation. They do. They, it's part of what, I want to offer. It's the mm. value I offer. And I've, and because I've started doing that, I've had these like really cool conversations. And I also have noticed that there's not so many white people talking about race and leadership. And so I feel like it's this really important conversation for white people. I heard the, heard the phrase this week, white people work. 
<laughs> we have to like do some work here. Yeah. We have to do some white people work. And, and I love that. And it feels so important. And it made my whole podcast. I, I felt like I was just fluffing people up and I wanted to ask more of them. And so now I feel like I'm asking more and I like it better. Yeah. A little more provocative. I like that mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Really, yeah. really pushing it. Well, and I think, I think if you're going to have guests and I'm going to tap into our, 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 um, our five things that I go over with everyone. Cause the first one is how to get great guests. So if you're going to have great guests on, you got to make sure they're really willing to be open and talk about that. So yeah. how have you been vetting these guests or ha- how have you been letting them know that this has got to be a part of the conversation? How are you doing that in the process? Yeah, we're having really honest upfront conversations with our guests. I, my assistant, Molly, you know, huge shout, shout out to Molly because she helps vet all of our guests and helps find some of them. I also realized I have a real opportunity to think up show ideas and um, invite the people that I want to talk about specific things. I like that. Yeah. So you're talking about getting guests to further a conversation. Yeah. So I have um, my daughter's a chef and, uh, you know, in the pandemic, it's just been horrible. And she works in a restaurant group. And early on in the restaurant group, the only thing I could think of, you know, was I was they were give, they were doing food for their um, all their employees when they all got furloughed. And uh, I went to pick up food for my daughter and I left a copy, two copies of my book, one for the CEO and one for their executive chef. And I had no idea if they'd read them or not, but they looked like they were experimenting really well. Yeah. <laughs> so I had my daughter sort of reach out and say, Hey, do you want to be on my mom's podcast? And they came on. So that's airing uh, next month. Uh, I love that. That's a great way to find someone. Well, and that's what I I did find about your guest list. Your guest list is not people that I've heard of or been on a hundred different podcasts before. They're all extremely articulate though, and they should be on a lot of podcasts. (laughs) So, so you found some really hidden gems. And I think, so I think this approach is working for you, Melon. Thank you. I, I love my guests. Like I had farmer Alvaro on and Oh my gosh, I loved him. Like it was early pandemic and his phone wouldn't stop ringing um, (laughs) because everybody wanted him to deliver organic vegetables. And he literally like they had a wait list and um, fun, but he was talking about supply chains and the pandemic and his, this is something something so many people don't know about. I know. I (laughs) Yes. It was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, so much fun. So what, how do you get great listeners? How do you increase your listenership? Yeah. And I mean, this one is, um, you know, just pure strategy. We look for people who have followings um, and, and um, I can't always interview farmer Alvaro because he's probably not going to help me grow my podcast brand. Although you'd Um, be shocked, right? (laughs) But he occasionally you'll be surprised. Never heard a podcast, right? Like yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you'd be um, surprised. Maybe all the delivery people on his router. I'll do that. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it it really is about making an intention around that, um, making sure they're getting automated reminders to put their stuff out on social, making sure they have really great graphics. Um, which we get from our podcast company, which is Podetize. Right. And, uh, I've already mentioned them. that you're a client, so don't worry about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, and, love- but I appreciate that. I think the graphics are good for you because it helps with your brand. So, you know, when you yeah, have a- It's, a, it's a, so easy. You have like visuals too. Yeah. Yes, it's so easy. We promote everything on our social. Um, we also repost our episodes. We, we try to be in some kind of regular- cadence with reposting episodes because it seems like a lot of content to create and then just put out one time. Oh, I'm so glad you're doing that. That's really good. Well, you know, it, this is interesting. I was talking with and interviewing so that her episode will air before the end of March, uh, Whitney Lauritsen, who is our social media strategist here at Podetize. And she has a podcast called This Might Get Uncomfortable. And one of the findings she had, and she's great at social media. So she, I mean, because she started out as an Instagram influencer and obviously I hired her to do social media for us. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's a, a track record here. She said that she was really surprised. One of the most surprising finds she had when reviewing 
um, her guest lists and all the stuff that had happened over 200 episodes because she just hit 200 episodes. Actually, today, as we record it, she hits 200. And um, that the guests she thought were the biggest influencers, had the biggest following, did the worst with sharing. And so oh, she found that the ones kind of in a sort of sweet spot of like, they've got enough to obviously show that they're putting effort into it, but not so much that they can, you know, just kind of like let it go and do whatever that those people worked harder to share her show. And she got more from them and she got more mm-hmm. from them because they were growing their social media following. So utilizing publicity had to be a part of their strategy to do that. Mm. And so that's where she found this kind of sweet spot in there of, of that. And so um, she, you know, she doesn't have numbers to say like, you know, that's 10,000 Instagram followers or something like that because it's so different in everybody's industry. But, but I thought that's really interesting find. And if you analyze maybe some of your best guests and then take a look at them and say, yeah, we want more of like that, then maybe you'll be able to improve mm-hmm. that going forward. Well, and the other thing that we're doing, and I have no idea if it'll work, it's an experiment. We're coming up on our year anniversary and we're trying to meet like a, you know, stretch goal for ourselves about downloads. And so we just went back to everybody who was on the show for the year and asked them to repost their episode. Nice. Um, Just to see, but also, um, I got a shout out on social media today, which was, Hey, congratulations to Melanie and her on her anniversary of her podcast which was a cool way for them to repost the episode, but it's also yeah. really good for me. It's so, really nice. Yeah. It gives yeah. you that endorsement. You've been doing this. Good for you. <laughs> I know. I was like, huh, that worked better than I thought. <laughs> no, that's, a, <laughs> that's great. I like that way is it, to go back and ask. It's not a lot to ask. You built rapport. I can tell through the interviews. So it's not a lot to ask a year later for someone to share their episode <laughs> right. again. Really not a lot yeah. to ask. So I think that's great that you're doing that. So the next thing we do is produce like a pro. That's how do you produce like a pro? And I know you're using us as pro production. So we don't want to talk about that. That's not the point on your end. What are you and your team doing to make this a better production for yourself? Are you researching? Are you prepping for interviews? What are you doing on your end? Probably not enough. So my goal for myself is that I produce content in my whole, this is across the board in my organization. I help people do their work, but I produce content. That's my job. I'm the only person who can produce content in my company. And um, so my goal is that I do that. So the quality of the production, the fact that I put makeup on and <laughs> have a glass of water next to me and you know all that, that's my job. Um, and, and so from a production point of view, I, I've, you know, we, we, Molly heads up podcasting in our organization. She makes sure everything gets loaded, makes sure, you know, one of the big ahas this year is we better, we all need to listen to our episodes. (laughs) It sounds crazy, but like, we just need to be like listening. Like we need to be consuming our own content so that we can experience it and understand it more deeply. That's Um, a great aha, I think, right there, Melanie, because so often we don't listen to our episodes. It took me, well, I produce so much content that it gets harder and harder for me to do that, but my team really is. Um, And sometimes they'll pull out quotes and I'm like, I said that? Wow, that was actually really, I'm impressed I said that. Like, you know, so sometimes we we aren't realizing, you know, the quality of what we're putting out there and the ways at which we could reuse that if we aren't re-listening to it. I know it's I hard to do it I in have, the moment, right? Yeah. I have a social media person who's going through old podcasts. I was a guest on and she comes up with the darndest things that I said. Right. <laughs> like, exactly. Really? So, Oh, I'm That's so glad in my book. I'm so glad that you have that now as a process, because that mm-hmm. is really going to, I think, make a difference. And because why should we be recreating new content? You're, you're busy. You are the content machine in the business, but you don't need to be creating it if you already have it. That's right. That's yeah. right. So production, I, I think that's all sort of around the production. Some of it is like, we need to trust our partner. Like 
productize. We need yeah. to trust them to do the work well and not to second guess that work. So yeah, that's I mean, this is hard. <laughs> Thank you like, for that, because that is a really hard thing is like, you know, sometimes don't get uh, and we are, we make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Right. And but we can't be you. We can't read your mind. And so if there's not a feedback loop, then we can't get better at what we do and we can't learn more from you. And so when you're creating that and being open to the idea that you are a part of we're partners in this. That's really great. So I'm so glad you said that. And I, I hope that other people do that with wh whoever their producers are, whoever mm -hmm. they're using for editing, um, because that can be a real success factor long-term. Well, and I really try to put my time into the things that are the 80%, like, or the 20%, I think it's the 20%. The 20%, the produce 80. Yep. Got it. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I don't, so I don't, I don't fret about the titles of my episodes. I'll give feedback broadly. Like I kept asking people about imposter syndrome and all of a sudden all my episodes were titled imposter syndrome. And I was like, wait, no more episodes titled imposter syndrome. <laughs> but like, so there's sort of broad strokes that learning piece, but I, I do think leaning in, I really appreciate the ability to lean in. Mm, nice. Yeah, that's great. So encourage engagement. So you've been pushing the stuff out on social. You've got kind of a plan going. How are you getting engagement with the community? How are you getting them to like, Feed, give them, give you feedback. I don't know that I get good feedback. <laughs> oh, I, I, so I this don't is know something how. to work on. <laughs> yeah, great. I have no idea. I'd love for you to help me figure out how to get more feedback. I felt like in the beginning, it was just super important to just produce, you know, half a year. Like I really had a goal of just kind of like, see if I could do it regularly for a year without fretting or with, right. with a light lift. Mm. And so now I'm like, okay, now what, what's the return? How do we start, you know, how, and I don't know how to get feedback. Maybe you have some so, great ideas for feedback. Great. Well, here's a, here's a chance for us to do some on-air coaching right now. Right. So I think that there is an opportunity for you to ask a, a pointed question. So when we just ask for feedback and we ask our, our listenership to just say, Hey, hey send me a message. If you've got something to say, yeah. it's too broad. But if we ask them specifically, what experiment have you done in your business in the last 30 days that is a result of COVID? Now we're asking a really specific question and give them a very specific place to respond to you. So message me back on Instagram, send me a Facebook message, comment on this post somewhere, you know, on my website, whatever that is, just be really specific about it. And don't, um, you can try some different places because there may be places where you're going to get more feedback than others. And you don't realize that yet. So, so try a place for a couple of times. And then if Instagram is not working, shift over to Facebook and see if Facebook works, you know, and so shift that up for yourself as an experiment to make sure that you're, you're getting to the right place where your listeners really want to respond or the majority of them do. Well, and I think that's see what cool. Happens. And, and I just switched to a WordPress site so I could do the speak pipe yep. app. Oh, you can do that there, there too. You tell them to leave you a message. Yeah. There. And, and I feel like I haven't, I'm not doing anything. I haven't announced it. I, I, it's just kind of sitting there and I'm like, hmm, now what do I do? So yeah. that's actually a great place to send everybody so and my recommendation is to have SpeakPipe and a place to drop a message to you, like a written message. Some people are still uncomfortable speaking. And okay. so, so having them both side by side has worked better for some people. And okay, so, cool. so if you have like your, your email list or, you know, your email pop up, so it just pops up and they can write you an email right there into your site. So have the two, okay. two buttons side by side, but that's a great place. So send them right there. Cause sending them back to your site is a way better way. They can see your books. They can see all your other content. So I prefer mm -hmm. it to be at your website, but for some people, their social just has bigger following, bigger community, and then follow up with the, whatever you said in that episode, make sure you're posting that out as the question of the week in your social community as well. So you're encouraging mm -hmm. that. And I, I suspect you probably are more heavy on LinkedIn. And so asking a question in LinkedIn is a really great way to get, to get people to respond. People want to engage there um, and they want to have their say, especially if you're asking for their viewpoint or their opinion, especially when it's at, at this sort of high level of a question. Mm. 
Cool. So, yeah. So, so try that. Maybe you can encourage some engagement and come back and tell us how it worked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds really good. So the last one we, we, we go over in our five things is monetizing your show. Did you intend to monetize it from the beginning? Are you looking at ways to monetize it now? What is, what are your thought process on it? So there's like the, gosh, would it be interesting to monetize it? I started running ads for my book. A, you know, it's a, it's a 495 digital book funnel. Um, and right. I started running those ads fairly recently. Um, so I, I sort of feel like sending people to my stuff might be the most valuable use of my podcast. Um, but I'd love feedback on that or love thoughts on that. Like, you know, I'm a business, so, uh, monetizing, is sexy. Like that's what I do. I'm a business coach, like, like business executive coach. So it's all about, you know, my, my father once said that farms are like money in the fields. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. That's <laughs> landscapes right. of money. Like, I love that. Cause of, you know, I love that thought. Um, so, so, I mean, the reality is, is you don't really want an outside monetization because it muddies everything for you. You want it to be some kind of inside monetization, whether it's yeah. sending people to a coaching program, do a webinar boot camp, whatever those things might be where people can get to know you better um, and maybe, and get a hint of one-on-one, -on -one. you know, this is one of the things that we do here. And you may want to look at that is that literally having a sort of pipeline of people where you'd say, Hey, let's do an on-air coaching and we'll do an mm. on-air coaching experiment. So one of my favorite podcasters, so I interviewed early on in the series for the binge factor, um, is, uh, is the host of the charisma quote quotient, uh, Kimmy Seltzer, Kim Seltzer. And, um, and she does that. She has her interview session. She has her or solo sessions that she does, which you're accomplishing by putting a really good setup on yours. And then, uh, and then she does a on-air coaching and she says that people apply to it because it's free and they don't think they can afford a session with her. Mm -hmm. And then they end up becoming clients by the time they're done with it. And so it is a really nice pipeline to be able to do that. Um, and so thinking about maybe adding a component of on-air coaching, you could try it once a month and then yeah, add it if it I, works. That's what I was sort of thinking that is that might be really fun to see if somebody wanted, um, like, I'm sure there's people that would be, think that was fun to yeah, think. Yeah. So it's I mean, a I don't combination know. of publicity for their company and for the, what they're, and for themselves, right. Cause you need to elevate yourself as a leader. And then at the same time, they're getting, you know, they're getting continual learning opportunity. So it's funny. I'm like a master certified coach. And even I like, I can feel a little like, oh my gosh, that's scary to do it. On it's air. scary to do it on air. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's sort of thrilling too. Right. Like, well, for... and that's why when I do these interviews, I always ask at the beginning, are you open to the coaching idea? Because some people just really aren't. And I have had people said, no, I don't want it. And I was like, okay, don't worry about it. We can talk about it after if you're interested in that, you know, if you're interested in really knowing, but I, I'll be kind because, you know, that's, I want to honor how they feel about it. And sometimes being public about it, it's just not the right way. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I think you being experimental, I was so glad you said, oh yes, of course I'm open to having, sure, having that. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, so we usually go over what is your binge factor? Did you know that people were binging on your episodes? Have you had a sense of that? Has anyone reached out and said, I listened to all 40 of your episodes and now I have a question? No. So you have no idea that people are binging on your show? No, I have no idea if people are listening. You know, I don't even, I, yeah, I feel so, and it's the same with selling my book. I feel like feedback loops are just astonishingly non-existent. So do you have a Kindle version of your book? Yep. Did you check out and see if people are highlighting it? No. Okay. So you can go in on the back end. I don't, I'm not an author like that. I'll figure so, it out. Yeah, yeah you can that, figure I'll, it out. Somebody and you go in on the that. back end and you can look and see pe where people are highlighting. Oh, that's, that's a cool. feedback loop. And it's great for your social media that's team. If you get a lot of people highlighting those, you should be pushing them out on social as the promotion for the book. 
And so, but that's a feedback loop. So yeah. So Shane Snow, a great author, and I'm a huge fan of his books. Um, and, uh, and so he came on the show here and told me that he was at being a writer was so lonely until crazy. Kindle came along and he was able well, to look yeah, at these highlights. It's so crazy. I, yeah. My book launched in April in December. I got quite a sizable check or well, that's know, payment. Good. So somebody read my book this year <laughs> or and that was like they from downloaded March it. See, that's May. the problem is that they downloaded it, but they haven't necessarily read it yet. So the well, highlights are I, signal that they were reading it. Yeah. Well, and I do hear that like, and I, I know that everybody, you know, people stop on chapter four. Like I know all these things <laughs> just from some conversation, but um, but yeah, the feedback loops, I think the Kindle thing is super cool. I wish we had that for, uh, for podcasts. Like I, I have yeah. to say, I've heard some people have been working on them and we're keeping an eye on those players, but none of them work really well right at this point, but that idea of that feedback loop. So what we do find is that somewhere at some point, you'll be able to see the indicators in your statistics on bingeability. And what happens is, is that when you see a spike, usually over, I'm going to say it's usually happens over a weekend, but things have been upended in the pandemic because people have more time on their hands. Um, but usually you'll see all of a sudden you get a, a bunch of listens across all your episodes in one, in mm -hmm. sort of a period of a week. And so you can see that, oh, that's got to be a binge listener coming through and doing all our shows. And so, so they went from one and they listened through the whole catalog. And so you'll usually see that happen um, in that format. And so when we see a lot of listens on our back episode, and it's not just one single episode, that's the indicator that you have, you, you do have binge listeners. So here's the thing, Melanie, I think you have all the potential to have a bingeable show. I think that it needs that your shift in the recent days to adding more of you is actually going to make that the case now. So mm, cool. that you didn't have that before, there really wasn't enough of you in it mm -hmm. to create that sort of, I, I want to hear this information, but I might pick and choose which shows I listen to based on what guest sounds interesting because I'm not tied to the host yet. So by tying us more to you, you create that binge factor because you, are, I mean, you are obvious, really deep knowledge of, of experimentation, of leadership in general. And I want to hear more of your viewpoint on that mm. and why you brought someone forward. That is your, your binge factor right there. And keeping that experimental edge to it is important. So. Yeah, I really like that. And, and, um, and I really see the purpose of it. Um, it, it, they're, they're uncomfortable shoes still for me. <laughs> well, and, and so here's, here's one of the, my coaching tips for you. So you have injected more of you. You'll tell a little story and all, all of those, um, nice little, um, you know, back and forth that you're doing with the, with the guests now, and you're not just waiting, asking a question, waiting, asking a question, but you're also sometimes forgetting to formulate and segue from your story to the next question. So making sure that you formulate that as a question. So one of the things that I do is rather than prepare questions ahead of time, which I absolutely hate it when people do that, because you can tell is I make a handful of bullet points. Like I, you, <laughs> you can see right here, I've got my <laughs> bullet points for you, right? These are my notes to me myself to make sure I ask you these things at some point in it. And so because I have, as I'm telling a story, I look over and I'm like, oh, I can formulate that as my next question. And so because it's not framed as a question, it makes it really easy for me to pick it up and, and insert it in so that I'm sure that I, I, I get through all of that. Cool. I like the idea of bullet points because I haven't wanted to have pat questions or prepped questions. I, and I don't want you to, it doesn't work out no. well. So yeah, that's, that's really affirming and really helpful, but to think of like, Cause sometimes I forget what was on their little notes that they sent me, or I, I feel like sometimes I wander a little, you know? And, uh, so I think that's, I like the bullet points. That's fantastic. So you also have this one episode that is your, it, it's an interview that was done of you or, or a, a talk you gave about your book. 
Uh, yeah, it was my launch. It was, the it was your launch. launch. Yeah. And it's right in the middle there. And I love that you have that in there. And I almost want that to be at the beginning. Oh, like the first episode? Yeah. Like make it Can your I zero, it? zero. Yes, absolutely. Redate oh. it. You just give oh. it a new date, um, but you might want to give it a, a, and you can insert it like an ad. It doesn't have to be put in like, an, you know, re-edited or anything like that. You could just insert it, but give it a framework so that you're giving your, just as you would set up a whole episode, you do that setup here for why you're sharing this with everyone. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. So this is, I, th- I think this gives you the best insight into what an experimental leader is. It's also my talk about when I launched the book. So you're getting like the why and the basis for what that is. And I thought this would be a really great intro to not only the show and my book, but to the process of what we're going to be talking about here on the experimental leader podcast. And then you play it. And then right, because so- people often start with the first episode. They do. And, and then so, they're getting and this, you dive these episodes in. that I were like me at my, like, I had no idea what I was doing. Right. And so, I'm a big fan of just doing what we call the zero, zero episode. Yes, it changes all your numbers. Keep that in mind. But it, it helps in sort of ca- capturing that new binge listener who's looking for a show. When binge listeners come into your show, they come in, they listen to your first episode, your last episode, or they skim them. And then maybe check out something in between where they see a really interesting guest or an interesting topic. And that's how they check out their show. It's usually three episodes they'll give it before they go, no, I'm not subscribing or not, not sticking around or yes, this is a show for me. And then they'll go back and they'll listen to the whole catalog. So cool. Well, I love that idea because it it isn't exactly where it should be in the whole. Well, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, it's nice to find it. And because of its title, it does stand out like, oh, this is what the show's about, but it's right in the middle of everything. So it's just, you know, not your first place you look. I have a question for you. Yeah. Like I, I know sometimes people do just like, you know, single topic things where they talk about something without a guest. Should I think about something like that or like, just, am I handling that in the intro and the outro? Uh, Look, I love them. I think they're really great. I think they invite more um, engagement from an audience that is starts to realize that you really have a coaching business and a program that can be offered to them. And it's hitting on topics that can be really useful. Do you want to have it be, it's a lot more work, right? You're adding more episodes per week because you still need those guest ones to help you share out, get your listenership growing, yeah, right? That's so right. So you have to have a balance of both. So we don't want to just switch two of our episodes a month to, to our topic and then two of interviews and not get, you know, we lose our value, right? We diminish the value. So we have to add on. So what's comfortable for you? Is it to do a bonus episode? Treat it like a bonus rather than a regular feature. So it doesn't start to feel too um, encumbering too time consuming yet Mm -hmm. until you're sure it's working. So add one or two bonus episodes a month and just kind of goes and, and maybe jot out for yourself the, you know, I'm going to do 10 total because I have 10 topics I'd like to cover that I think are essential to being a good experimental leader. They might tie into some things in your book and keep them short. Do not, not do long ones. I'd say do 15 minutes, that kind of thing. And, uh, and test them out see how they're working for you. They're going to give you great social media content, great quotes and great other things. So at minimum, you've really built up a whole report, uh, you know, repertoire of all of this material that your team can use again and again and again in all these other places. Well, and I'm doing Facebook lives every week for, and they're like five minutes. And so, and we're repurposing those videos. So maybe that handle. Maybe start with one of those. Start with using some of those and put those as your podcast initially. So just try it. A five minute one's not bad. You can self-publish them in our platform. So you don't need to go through us and, you know, do all the fancy editing. You can add your intro, outro on them and everything. And so, you know, that's a, that's a simple way for you to go about and just test that out. And if it's working really well, then you can always try something a little bit longer form. See if the 15 minute one does well. Um, and and just try it. Hmm. It's always an experiment here, Melanie, right? (laughs) Well, I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting to, um, to sort of like enter this world. 
I, I, this morning I said, oh, I, my husband said, what'd you do while you were waiting for the kids swimming for an hour and a half at five o'clock in the morning? (laughs) Oh my goodness. And I was like, well, I consumed some content. (laughs) I listened to some things for a change, right? (laughs) I did some podcasts. I did some audio books, (laughs) did some social media. (laughs) Like I consumed some content this morning. He said, oh, is that what we call it now? Yes, that's right. Yes, (laughs) that's right. We're consuming. Uh, consuming I love that. I know that is so funny. Well, I asked this kind of early on and then we, we jumped over it, but what's next for you? You got to, you're hitting your year. What's next for you? What do you want to accomplish in this next year? You did it consistently and constantly for one year. What's up for you in this next year? I want to be funnier. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's a great goal, Melanie. (laughs) And I want to swear more. (laughs) Break that (laughs) ladylike. Yeah. Because, you know, I know that like, um, when I work with tech teams, I know if I'm in a room full of men, I always say fuck in the first, you know, I want to say it in the first 10 minutes. And I think there's a way that, you know, that could add to my podcast if I just play a little harder. (laughs) Well, you know, and your audience is older. So, I mean, they're, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily, it's not a mompreneur podcast. So there's not going to be kids in the room or, or, you know, in the car. Right. So perfectly fine. If that's who your audience is and that's, what's going to resonate with them and that's where they are, then do it right. Be who you really Mm -hmm. are, be who they want, you know, they want to hear. Yeah. Somehow in the, because, you know, like trying to learn how to be on camera and on video, I might be playing like a little too careful. Mm. And it's like, I want to belly laugh with people. I want to, you know, swear and talk about things we shouldn't talk about. And so this you know, happens, all the things, this happens, yeah, right? Things. This happens naturally, it, it, occasionally, but to, to, but to really like give yourself permission to do that is another mm-hmm. thing. Right. So in, in last, uh, last week's coaching call for potatize, I don't know if you heard it, but our dog went wild right in the middle of our, of our talk because she saw a squirrel outside the, the glass doors. And so you hear her, she jumps up and she's scratching the door. And I literally got freaked out. Like I went, (gasps) and I just started laughing because it was so funny that it happened right in the middle of everything. And she caught me so off guard. And I got a lot of comments from this, like Tracy, you laugh and you're personable, but that was hilarious. And so when, when it breaks through like that, you'll know like, okay, I'm free enough. This audience knows me. I can be who I'm myself. And that's my coaching. Those are all my clients. So like, they know me really well. So and they know our dog, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't want to become because I'm on screen and I don't want to become a boring middle aged, <laughs> like, you know, careful person, you know, with my clients, I talk about everything. And there's a way that I want to invite that in and, and just be more of that. So before we go, Melanie, I want you're, you're the queen of experimenting here. So let's talk about and and let's what advice do you have for someone who is thinking about starting this podcast experiment, but is sort of afraid to to dive in and get going? I mean, I feel like I'm not going to sound smart at all, except hire potatize. I've, I've referred so <laughs> many clients to potatize. I'm almost it's almost embarrassing. Like, you we know, appreciate it, that <laughs> it it um. It's like people say they want a podcast. I'm like, just pay them. They're good. Let so, them. So do what their you're thing. really saying though is get someone in your corner. Hire somebody. Don't try to do it all. Like let yourself enjoy the journey and and take as much off your plate. Be a content producer that you're only doing the part that you have to do so that you can be good at that part. I'm on a whole bunch of groups online, you know, podcast groups. And the amount of people who are struggling with tech and like feel sound like their souls are ripped out. (laughs) It's like, they're all, they all sound like that. And I don't have that experience. So, you know, seek advice, talk to people, people can reach out to me. I'll have a quick chat about your podcast, like (laughs) have joy in your heart and go get lots of input. And then hire people to help you do the hard parts. You can always pick them up back up later if you think, wow, I just don't have enough work while I'm doing this. 
you know, you can pick up the work later, but don't try to do it all out of the gate. It's too much to learn. Oh, it really is. I, I'm so glad you said that. I mean, I think that that's the case for so many people is like they, they're getting a, hung up on one aspect. For some people, it's the tech. For other people, it might be confidence in their voice. I mean, you know, you don't know what that is. But getting past that and, you know, maybe just starting to look like Melanie did, that this is an experiment and it's not a like something that you just set in stone here that is like, you know, that that accepting even that, Melanie, I think, you know, was a brilliant start for you. Well, and I think also be really clear on uh, Seth Godin always asks, what's it for? And, um, and know what your podcast is for. It helps you with target client. You know, it helps you with all the things. Who are your guests? Who are, what are you trying to do? Make sure you know why you're doing it. It's not just fun to have a podcast. Um, I mean, it might be fun to just have a podcast. I I have, you know, like middle of the night dreams where I'm like, oh, I should have a sex show or I should have a. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Melanie, I, I don't. Actually, you're going to have but... spinoffs. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, because they're not for anything. Like know what your podcast is for, especially if you're in business, like you have to know what it's for. Oh, Melanie, I'm so glad you came on the show today. I'm so glad that everyone got to hear how you've been experimenting and getting the Experimental Leader podcast going. So everyone, you're going to want to check out the Experimental Leader podcast, Melanie Parrish, and you'll be able to find everything on how to reach her, how to get to her show, how to get to her website, how to check out all of that by going to thebingefactor.com. Melanie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been so fun to get to meet you. Uh, Didn't you love how Melanie sort of let loose at the end. She's she's like thinking experimentally in her mind right there. We gave her the freedom over the course of this interview to start to do exactly what she said she wanted to do next. I just love that. That always makes me feel so good when I see uh, someone's light eyes light up with an idea or someone really being so proud of the accomplishments of what they've created. And Melanie has done such a great job of being the content producer for her company and for her coaching business and everything that she needs. And 40 episodes into it, you can see the improvements in the show. You can see that she's on a great path to creating a truly bingeable show. And when she taps into just the right audience, and as she put it, the audience from the the just starting out as a leader to being like three years into it, that perfect sweet spot of her audience where she can really truly help them, not only are they going to consume everything she has, they're going to ask for more. And that's when they do more than just buy your book. They ask for her coaching and they ask for her help because she's going to be their guide and their leader. So this is ideal. She's positioning everything up just right. And I love where she's going with her show. So I'm so glad you could learn from her today. And I look forward to bringing you more of these new hybrid styles where we can do a little bit of coaching and a a lot of success tips at the same time. Because I think we learn from both of those at, um, and it's helpful to learn from both of those within it. Because the thing that I'm hearing again and again from podcasters out there is although they feel that they hit a certain success metric, they don't feel successful everywhere. They might need to encourage more engagement as Melanie needs to, or increase listeners or dial in this guesting thing that's not going right for them. So here, tap into this, pull the little nuggets that are going to work for you. Make one change to your show. That's my challenge to you today. Make one new experiment in your show. Change something today and go check out Melanie Paris's show, The Experimental Leader, and see all the changes that she's created. You can find all that information at the blog post for this episode at thebidgefactor.com. And of course, don't be afraid. Apply to the show and let me both help guide you and let your success success tips guide others. So thanks again, everyone, for listening. I'll be back next week with another Bingeable Podcaster. You've been listening to the Binge Factor Podcast. For more information on podcasting and video casting success tips and tactics, please go to thebingefactor.com. And be sure to listen to our other show for podcasters called Feed Your Brand. If you'd like to be interviewed on this show, as well as featured in Tracy's column, please go to thebingefactor.com slash guest and apply. 